Well, men and women of Australia, Britain and abroad, it's a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the first seminar in the Menzies Centre's relaunch season. A particularly warm welcome to our speaker, Emeritus Professor Judith Brett, about whom more in a moment. Uh, to our co-host, the Centre for Life Writing Research here in King's. And let me give a quick plug uh, for the College's Arts and Humanities Research Institute, which looks after all of us uh, research centres. And um, of course, their staff have been integral to tonight's organisation, with particular thanks to Abby, who's um, here tonight. You'll notice that there are brochures down here for the Arts and Humanities, research, uh, Arts and Humanities Festival here at King's, which is taking place in October and which uh, the Menzies Centre is taking an active part. So I urge you to take both one of those beautiful um, new brochures for the festival and also the um, handout uh, in A4 paper which details the Menzies Centre seminars for the next, um, uh, for the coming autumn season. We all of us are keen always to be better known. We want you to tell your friends about us, to visit, our, to visit our websites, to check out the MCAS Australian Studies Network on Facebook, which has been going great guns, thanks to my colleague Simon. Um, and you don't have to be a member of Facebook to check out that Facebook site. I urge you to follow me on Twitter at at Ozonstrand. <laughs> and anybody that wants to tweet about tonight's uh, seminar, we'd be very welcome and happy for you to do that. And we have the hashtag MCASOz if you want to um, be able to join up all of those responses to Judy's wonderful paper, and which I anticipate will be wonderful, of course. It seems only appropriate that our speaker tonight should not only be an esteemed professor of politics, well known for her academic writing and her journalism, but also the writer of the key text on the Menzies Centre's namesake. Judy's Robert Menzies' Forgotten People confronted the paradoxical character of Sir Robert Menzies' public persona and provided unforgettable readings of Menzies' most famous speech one in which he invented the Australian middle classes in a manner which would sustain him in power for decades. The Sir Robert Menzies Memorial Trust were substantial financial contributors to our centre when it was established in 1982. We've been thinking about our own roots as a, as a centre as we celebrate the 15th year of our time at King's while looking still further back to those initial years, trying to recapture the excitement of our opening, when Prime Minister Bob Hawke, in the presence of the Queen Mother, commented on the need to promote in Australia, I quote, the perception, sorry, that to promote in Britain, the perception of Australia as an independent nation with its own aspirations, with its own identity, its separate patterns of historical and political development, its own social and cultural values, and its need for a specific specifically Australian foreign and defence policy. They're words that we hear echoed somewhere north of here, somewhat frequently, just recently. I think a sense of Australia's cultural independence is much better established in Britain than it was in 1982. Though perhaps Britons do not yet quite see, as Hawke claimed later in his speech, that Australians know their country belongs in the Southeast Asian region. I'm not sure Australians even, know, Australians even know that anymore. What I do know is that the richness of Australian culture, its paradoxes and its enigmas are the very lifeblood of the Menzies Centre today. And who better than a life writer extraordinaire, extraordinaire like La Trobe University's Emeritus Professor Judith Brett to throw light on the embodiment on one particular Australian enigma, Alfred Deakin. Please join me in welcoming her. Um, thank you very much, Ian. And um, I'm very pleased to be here at the Menzies Centre again. I haven't visited it since it moved from Russell Square uh, to this... I'm trying to think of the right adjective. <laughs> location, I'll just say to this new location. OK. And I'm also pleased that it's a joint seminar with the Centre for Life Writing. And I've tried to put some more general biographical reflections into this um, for people who've been able to come from there. So thank you, Ian, very much for organising it. Now, Alfred Deakin, or just Deakin as he tends to get talked about in Australian history and in, even in contemporary Australian political life, is one of the founding fathers of the Commonwealth. He's a man after whom things are named. There's a suburb, an electorate. In my own state of Victoria, there's a university. 
And for most Australians today, that's all he is. He's just become a name, Deacon. With a few bare facts attached to him, um, such as that he was a, uh, an early Prime Minister who dabbled in spiritualism. I'm working on a new biography with the aim of re-enlivening Deacon in the contemporary political imagination to bring out the man behind the image of the Victorian worthy that you can see there. Although I have to say he's a lot more handsome than a lot of the Victorian worthies uh, one could have worked on, and much slimmer. <laughs> he was always uh, very concerned about his, um, his health and his physical fitness. But he's a very difficult man to understand. He's complex, uh, he's elusive, and he's immensely voluble on himself and others. So the title for the book is going to be The Enigmatic Mr Deacon, and I'll return at the end of the lecture to the provenance of that title. What I'm going to do roughly in the lecture is to follow the stages of his life from childhood through to midlife uh, to discuss aspects of those three life stages. So his childhood, his young manhood, and the, the, the deep needs and life questions that politics was answering for him then, and his midlife. And in general, the sort of overarching question, which um, I think is the overarching question for all biographies of political figures, is why politics? What was it about politics that drew Deacon to it, and why did he stay? Now, I thought that probably, as some people here not just the Australians may not be uh, very familiar with the outline of Deacon's life. I'll just do a rough run through um, of, the, of the sort of key events and dates so that when I'm then sort of doing some interpretive moves, you've got some idea of what, uh, where, what we're talking about. So he was born in 1856, the second child and only son of colonists who arrived in Australia in 1850 just before the gold. His parents migrated from Abergavenny in Wales, and there were only two children. And this, um, I think, is actually quite crucial in understanding Deacon's life, because they could afford to educate him uh, extraordinarily well, and his sister, too, um, for their times and for their station. He matriculated, he studied law part-time, and then took up journalism to pay the bills when the briefs were slow in coming. Through spiritualism, he met the editor of The Age, David Syme, who was one of the most powerful men in the colony of, in colonial, the colony of Victoria, and who used his paper remorselessly to influence politics. He was not unlike a contemporary Australian-born newspaper proprietor uh, in many ways. Now, Syme suggested to some electors who were looking for a Liberal candidate that they try the young deacon. And so at the age of 23, he contested and won um, a seat in the parliament. He, there was a bit of toing and fro flowing, but after he, after he eventually, uh, around a year later, won a seat which he then held. So he entered colonial uh, Victorian politics almost by accident at, the, at this very young age on the basis of his lifelong capacity to charm older men and because the campaign trail revealed his extraordinary gifts for oratory in the Liberal cause. The terms Liberal and Conservative don't quite mean the same as they did here at that time. By British standards of the day, most of the colonial politicians uh, who were called Conservatives by David Syme in particular would have been Liberal. Now, I don't want to d dwell on this, but just to note, uh, that the key defining policies of the liberalism that Deacon took up and what for him would have been the core of his identity as a liberal were the need to limit the powers of the upper house. There was a, uh, an extraordinarily obstructive upper house that was elected on a very restricted franchise. The protection of industry. Of, um, so this Victorian colonial liberalism was not free trade and free compulsory and, sec and secular state provided education, which put the Liberals in constant tension with Roman Catholics who wanted to run their own school system. The young deacon was soon a minister, and by 1886 he was the chief secretary in a coalition ministry. Uh, I'm not going to say much about his marriage. Um, in 1887 he visited London for the first time for the Imperial Conference, and on his own account he stood up to Lord Salisbury over Britain's reluctance to annex the New Hebrides. This gave him a great deal of um, publicity in 
back home in Australia and he became a sort of representative of the Australian native born's aspirations for some, fo for some form of independence or at least recognition. He wasn't a Republican though. In 1890, he resigned from the ministry to the backbench and he returned to the bar. And for the next decade, he refused all entreaties to take up a position of leadership. The boom um, in Victoria and in Melbourne in particular had enjoyed in the late 1880s was ending and he'd lost his sense of political purpose and his optimism. Worse was to come for the colony and three years later the banks crashed and he lost a good deal of his own and his family's money. Now political purpose was rekindled for him um, in the sort of middle 1890s with the growing movement for federation and he became its passionate advocate, putting its pow his powers of oratory essentially to the service of, of federation. He was Prime Minister three times during the first decade of the new Commonwealth and he was closely identified with its foundational policies, with white Australia, with protection of industry and later of agriculture and with wages set by arbitration. He was also the architect of the fusion of the Liberal and Conservative parties uh, in, in Australia in the face of a very powerfully growing and fast, powerful and fast growing Labor Party. So in, in that sense, he's there, he's, he's instrumental in the birth of, this, of the form that our two party system took. So there's the public political life um, just sketched. He was also running all through this, he had an intense religious life, um, which he wrote a lot about. and. I want to say something about that. He left politics in 1913 and he got what looks from the evidence of his writing to have got early onset dementia. Uh, and the, sa the last years of his life are very sad as his fine mind is overtaken by dementia. Now, I just want to make three points about this timeline. The first is to notice how relatively short Deacon's active political life was. It's essentially only three decades. And the extreme youth of its beginnings. Deacon is perhaps Australia's first professional politician in many ways. In colonial Australia, most men entered politics in their 40s and 50s after they'd established themselves in other occupations or in businesses or had, had set up farms or pastoral properties. And although Deakin was working as a journalist when he first became a parliamentarian, it was very much a part-time job and he was still living with his parents and probably paying a bit of board. The majority of his fellow parliamentarians then were men of his, of his father's generation and the first decade of his political life is essentially spent with him as the youngest in the room. The second point to notice is that most of his life is lived within the reign of Queen Victoria. He's a child of the Victorian age, shaped by its culture, its doubts and its pride. But in much of the historical writing that it, that's been done on, on um, Deakin, it's as if he's treated, I think, as a 20th century man. He enters national history in the 1890s as a passionate advocate of federation and he secures his foundational place with the prime ministerships of the next decade. So in our national story, he's seen as there at the beginning. He's a man who starts things. The Deaconite Settlement, as it's called, in which protective tariffs were traded for wage arbitration. Deaconite liberalism is also often referred to as an enduring tradition in the Liberal Party. These are about the foundations of key 20th century institutions, and this is the role they play in national history. But for Deakin's biographer, they're at the end of his political life, not at the beginning. They come in the last decade, and the meanings they hold for Deakin are not necessarily those which they come to hold for 20th century political history. I think I have it. Oh, hang on, that's the wrong, it's all right. This is the, the young deacon at about the time he first entered Parliament in 1880. And so one of the questions that I've got to try to grapple with is which of this young man's experiences, doubts and ambitions are still resonating in his lived experience in the first decade of Australia's uh, new Commonwealth and which of the debates and ideas of his formative decades are still shaping his thinking. 
The third point to notice about this timeline uh, is that Deakin's life spans the settled periodizations of both colonial Victorian and Australian history. This is a sort of historiographic point, really. But the shape of Victorian colonial history is of three decades of spectacular growth from the discovery of gold in the early 1850s to the depression and devastating crashes of the early 1890s, from which emerges the cautious, wow, flourish, brown and cream Melbourne that people of my age would remember from their childhood. In the 1890s, Australia, um, Australian historiographic attention shifts from the colonial to the national story, and the 1890s become the decade from which the new nation of the 20th century is born. The new literary nationalism of Lawson, Patterson and the Bulletin, the painterly mastery of Australian light and landscape by the Heidelberg School, the birth of the Labor Party, and most importantly for Deakin's story, the Federation movement. After Federation, the history of Victoria and of all the other states, or colonies become states, fades into a parochial background. Probably the only Victorian known to most Australians from the 50 years after the discovery of gold is? Question? Answer? It's really easy. Ned Kelly. Exactly. <laughs> Ned Kelly. <laughs> I knew you'd be able to get that one. And most Australians, I would think, would not be able to name another Australian figure from the period from 1850 to 1900. They're okay with Captain Cook and a few of the early settlers, then it's just basically total blank. So that's a bit of a challenge too. <laughs> because what it means when you're writing a biography of an important figure in that period is you can't take any historical knowledge really for granted. Okay. So the, the point there is that the 1890s, which are, if you like, the end of the Victorians, if Victoria's story, it then just goes into this sort of parochial Wowserish gloom for the next de century. And the new nation sort of emerges out of it as, as, as Australia. That's actually the middle of Deacon's life. So um, it's got a quite different, what I was going to argue, it's got a quite different sort of rhythm. So to the man and, the, and this over, overarching question, why politics? A recurring theme in Deacon's private writing is a sense of division between an inner self, aloof and self-contained, and a second outer self which figures, parades, acts, executes, speaks in its visible, tangible, recordable existence. That's his words. This outer self, he notes, has been boundlessly energetic and almost ceaselessly engaged in practical affairs. The other, barely known even to his closest friends and family, was lived in his reading, his musing, and his manuscripts, which, he says, piled in my drawers under lock and key. Living at the heart of things, a most untiring agent in the executive and legislative life of politics, with pulse oftener at fever pitch than those of the most compulsive gambler or speculator, I feel and have always felt aloof. Deacon kept a prayer diary from his early days in Parliament, as well as various journals of reflection. And on his birthday in 1885, he wrote, 29 and nothing done. Now, he's actually done quite a lot. Later that same year, he lamented in a prayer that he was afflicted with a sense of a wasted life, of unearned ease, undeserved blessings, and unmerited repose that he was shallow and poor and frail in spirit, in mind and in flesh, the mere creature of other wills sunk in dreamy sloth and wayward idleness. In 1888, at the height of his political success, he's the busy chief secretary of the booming colony of Victoria. He has a beautiful and much loved wife and two young daughters, he writes. The outward scene and the current affairs pass by me as if I were in a dream. I can only with effort compel myself, even languidly, to protect myself in person, in prospects or position. And in 1904, there's this cry of despair. I woke in utter darkness and with the world's weight crushing me. Life seemed leaden without a vista that was not failure, shame, collapse. Now this detachment and inner loneliness, these periodic experiences of dissociation and the sense of chaos and purposelessness, which at times threaten to overwhelm him, have made this outwardly cheerful, successful man a puzzle to biographers, who, while mostly interested in his political career and achievements, have had to contend with the states of mind that are revealed in his private writings. So how am I to understand 
this the origins of Deacon's sense of a divided self and its consequences for his political life. And I'm just going to do a little brief sketch of the sort of answer that I've been developing. I've argued it in a bit more detail in an article in Historical Studies. Deacon remembered himself as an unhappy child, a timid, lonely little boy who sought solace in daydreaming and in books. As a boy, I was not happy. I was happy when reading and occasionally at play, but not always often intensely and unreasonably miserable. So Deacon's own childhood unhappiness was actually a lifelong puzzle to himself as well. He became a daydreamer and an obsessive reader. I spun romance after romance based on my favourite books in which I was the culmination of all heroes, winning a long line of peerless beauties under the most desperate and amazing circumstances. Now, like many people who grow up to love books, Deacon came from a home in which books, reading and writing were highly valued. Deacon's parents were active participants in Britain's 19th century literary culture, both, um, and they passed, you know, that books were actually quite central to the home life, and that's not um, uncommon in this period. Now, I'm just, I don't know who's this is um, an interview uh, from an interview that Deacon gave when he first became Prime Minister, and he chose to have a photo of himself taken in his dressing gown. Uh, for the cold, for the warmth in his library. And there was another photo uh, which I was going to show you, which, um, this, which is the second one in the series, where he's seen taking Carlyle's... Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the book now. It's that dreadful book about the tailor. Um, Sartor Rosatus off the desk. Oh, sorry, off his shelves. Um, so he... he this presentation of himself as a man of, of the book is, is very important. So although it was characteristic in many ways of his time and class, Deacon's, there was something excessive, almost compulsive, about Deacon's love of books and reading. This was most obvious in his boyhood when he read greedily and with little discrimination. He'd spend Saturdays at the public library, holidays after school. And later, even when he was at his busiest in politics, he found time to read. He read before and after breakfast on Sundays, 30 to 40 hours a week in the summer months, when traveling and even in the house during tedious or meaningless debates, he would have a book under the desk. And if no book was to hand or it was too dark to read, in sleepless nights, in long journeys and weary waitings, he would recite some of the thousands of lines of English poetry that were stored in his remarkable memory. Deacon's use of books and words and poetry to escape misery and loneliness began early, which suggests that the reasons lie, in part at least, in the circumstances um, of his family and childhood. This is um, the only photo we have of the family together. Sarah, William, and uh, the daughter, Katie, whose sister, who's six years older. At the age of four, Deacon joined Katie at a small board, uh, girls' boarding school. Katie had already been there for two years. Now, four's a very young age for a child to be sent away to school, and it was here that he developed his habit of using books and fantasy as an escape from his miserable loneliness. From the perspective of today's sensitivity to children's emotional and psychological needs, sending a little boy of four away seems an unusual decision. But even for the time, it's an unusual decision, um, given the very small size of the family. Sarah was not you know, overburdened with work and children. So it's a, a question for me as to why William and Sarah sent their precious young son away. Now, there's a, one plausible reason is concern for his health at a time when child death rates in Melbourne were high. And another is that Sarah was not coping well in the early years of home migration, and she may well have suffered miscarriages and depression. There's fragmentary evidence to support both of those reasons, which I won't rehearse here, except to say that whatever the reasons, this early separation from his mother, I believe, had a lifelong effect on Deacon and contributed to the periodic crises of meaning and sense of futility, which sometimes overwhelmed him. The received interpretation of Deacon's relationship with his political vocation is that he embraced it reluctantly, and Deacon himself gave a lot of it, you know, credence to this for practical and material reasons, but that he always yearned for a literary vocation. 
After his death, when his lifetime of private writings were discovered, there was plenty to support this interpretation, um, although not in terms of the quality. It was in May, it's enormously repetitive. He just wrote uh, as a running pen, very rarely reread anything, it's t it rewrote the same thoughts over and over again, but it's like he has this mind that's just continually churning out words, um, except when he's asleep. Now, I don't agree with this um, interpretation of Deacon as, in a sense, embracing the political vocation reluctantly. I think there's a real danger of prioritising private writings of a biographical subject as more real than their public actions. In Deacon's case, where the private writing is so voluminous, it's tempting for those who have themselves chosen the life of the word to believe that for others too, it would be their first preference. But we have to look not just at what people say or write, but at what they do. Not just at the inner life, but at the outer life of action and event and the relationship between them. So although books and writing retained their deep attraction for Deacon throughout his life, I think he knew at some level that the literary life would have mired him in despair. Here's another of his reflections from 1888. I think I'll put up this one. Here we are. This is... Um, it's written in January when he's on his holidays at the seaside and he's indulging his passion for reading. To read, to retire, to chat quietly about nothing. This is all I feel I am truly capable of. Such is frequently the irresistible urge of self-consciousness, and it is only by committing myself as with shut eyes to a stream that I ner nerve myself to do familiar things. Now, there are two things going on in this passage. The first is a conventional expression of languid malaise in which literary life was the life of retreat from, from rather than engagement with the world, a life of chatting quietly about this and that. But the second, in which eyes shut, he jumps into the stream of life, indicates that there is real psychological pressure here, that Deacon knew he needed a busy, engaged, active outer life to keep at bay the sense of despair and futility uh, always lurking in his inner world. In the 1903 interview that, um, it, in Punch that I referred to when he first became Prime Minister, there, as I said, was another photo of Deacon reaching for a copy of Carlyle's Sartor Rosatus which he describes as the foundation stone of his library and the first work that turned his thoughts in serious channels. Now, he'd bought this book on impulse. It was the first book he ever bought. Um, after his father had read to him and his sister Carlyle's address as rector of the University of, Can of Edinburgh, in which he tells the assembled students that the first of all problems for a man is to find out what kind of work he is to do in the universe. Victorian moralists like Carlyle were preoccupied with the question of motivation as Christianity declined and constantly anxious about the possibility of men sinking into a state of psychological malaise. Carlyle's solution was work and the embrace of duty. Now, this wasn't an original idea of Carlyle's, but a wild, widely held belief of the Victorians. However, Carlyle gave it repeated and vivid expression. His blessed is he who has found his work, let him ask no other blessedness, was one of Deacon's favourite quotations which he would copy into um, his various notebooks. Uh, it's underlined in his copy of Past and Present, as are two quotes on idleness. One monster there is in the world, the idle man, and in idleness alone is the perpetual despair. So the busy outer life of politics was not just some sort of dutiful pet penance, I want to argue, but a necessary protection in some ways against depression. As a young man, uh, as I'd already mentioned, Deacon was engaged with spiritualism. And he, although when he went into politics, he, to some extent, I mean, he withdrew from a formal organisational involvement, in part because it, he was mocked for his spiritualism by his political opponents, and um, he really stayed uh, a believer in messages from beyond um, for his whole life. He spent his late teens and early 20s seeking, gu seeking guidance as to his life's work. This wasn't, as it would be today, experienced as a matter of choice or desire, but as the discovery of his destiny. And he put a good deal of effort into this discovery. He consulted phronologists um, he, and he attended seances. 
from 1874 when he was 18 and, until around 1880 when he went into politics, he was active in the Association of Progressive Spiritualists. Now around 1880, when he was just beginning his political career, he was a regular attender of seances conducted by a Mrs. Sterling and a diary of these seances survives in which he records a series of prophecy, prophecies that convinced him his future lay in politics. To the end of his days, he believed that these prophecies that he received in Mrs. Sterling's parlour were confirmed by the events that unfolded over the next five years or so. Politics and money are the main themes of this curious and very detailed spiritual diary in which the stars of English liberalism make regular visits. There's Mill, Bunyan, Macaulay come and offer him advice and assistance. Macaulay was a frequent visitor and advised him to reread his history, particularly the second volume on Charles II for illustrations of precedents, precedents of the privileges of the assembly and promised to be with him at a forthcoming lecture, filling his mind with the results of his knowledge. In another entry, Deacon expresses his conviction that grand spirits will lend my words weight so that I shall convince and conquer and be a great reformer. Deacon comes through this diary record as eagerly, anxiously seeking reassurance. And not to yield to my moments of depression, but to trust all to the spirits, he writes. On the morning of Friday, December the 17th, 1880, the usual lineup in Mrs. Sterling's parlour was joined by Archibald McIntosh, who was a financial guide from Ballarat, who had died 50, five years earlier. And McIntosh became a source of financial advice for the new MP on the purchase of shares in various mining ventures and in a speculative gas company, which claimed to have discovered an easy and practicable method of decomposing water. And Deacon duly purchased shares in this gas company and in various mines that the spirits advised him on. In April, he records that Macaulay was generally pleased with his development and told him that if he followed Archie's advice, he would be able to put down his pen. They have given me financial advice, he writes, to free and strengthen me for their higher work. As it turned out, as I said, the gas speculation and the mining shares were utter failures. But he continued to believe that the political prophecies had been fulfilled. So to understand the influence of spiritualism on Deacon's life without dismissing it as nonsense and without playing it for laughs, although none of you seem to find getting share advice from, <laughs> from a, a spirit comical. Uh, um, I've decided that I have to just think about what psychological needs are bit uses of the, this, these regular visits to the seance, uh, regular seances are having. He's, he's going at this stage weekly, often twice weekly, to Mrs. Sterling. And it's like the regularity of a meeting with a psychotherapist or a counsellor. Uh, Al Gabe uh, has done excellent research into Deacon's complex religious and theological thinking, and he writes of the patterns of desire in Deacon's youthful engagement with spiritualism, the conviction of being singled out by higher powers, the sense of being chosen to do great work on behalf of a cause was deeply embedded in Deacon's outlook on the world and would never leave him. Without the steady conviction that he was working for something greater than himself, a political career would not have held Deacon for so long. So the big answer to the question then, why did Deacon choose and stay in the political life, is because he thought it was his destiny and that God had chosen him to do this. Though the, the major theme of the prayers, and it's, it, and it's the recurring question, is, oh God, you know, show me that I, my, my feet are on the right path through life. So it's continually tested, but on the other hand, he, he, he stays with the political path he's chosen. So during the um, 1880s, the trajectory of Deacon's life was deeply in tune with that of the colony and the city in which he lived. Exuberant, optimistic, expansive. The children of the gold rush migrants like himself were coming of age, marrying, building houses. British migrants were pouring into the capital, as was British money, attracted by higher rates of interest. This was the decade of marvellous Melbourne, the bustling metropolis of commerce where everyone was on the make. And almost everyone was investing in real estate. 
Between 1888 and 1893, marvellous Melbourne plummeted from the heights of the International Centenary Exhibition and the land boom to the shameful days in April 1893 when all but three of the banks closed their doors to staunch runs from panicked investors. This trauma changed Melbourne's civic personality for a century. From the confident, flashy young metropolis of new money and grand buildings to the staid Wowserish provincial town that I've already mentioned. Now, in his own autobiographical reflections, Deakin skims very lightly over these years. He leaves only the briefest comment. When, with the rest, I plunged into the boom, losing all the money my father had available, which he had confidingly placed at my disposal, and having to face the long and bitter experience to repay it, as I at last succeeded in doing to my mother and sister after his decease. And so it seems in a lot of the political biographical narratives that exist that he behaved honourably when many of his peers did not. He's seen very much as an innocent abroad, led astray by his more worldly friends. But Deacon wasn't just one of the herd. He was the colony's chief secretary. He was on the board of some of the companies that went bust, taking many other people's savings besides um, his own and his father's. And this is just a, an image from the time. He's often presented as with a schoolboy cap on in, in images to highlight his youth. This is the Premier Gillies. But this is to say that in the in the political imagination of the time, Deacon is seen as quite closely associated with the, um, the land boom. He wasn't, as I said, a major player, but nor was he a bystander. And I believe that these years in the midpoint of his life are crucial to understanding the later Deacon and the passionate energy he brought to the quest for federation. In his prayers around this time, particularly once things are starting to go bad financially, Deacon expresses misgivings that in his pursuit of wealth and power, he had entered into perilous ways. But he reminded himself of their justification. He needed wealth for the sake of those dependent on him and power for its usefulness, that I may follow and persuade others to follow the path which will lead to the elevation of national life and thought and permanence of well-earned prosperity. He wrote to Graham Berry, who was one of his political mentors and the first Premier he served, that after the land boom, people of all classes deprecated any fierce party struggle. Besides, the trouble is where to find a cause if we wanted one. This is a revealing comment. Deacon's interest in politics was flagging as another year of cabinet meetings, budget preparation, parliamentary debates, deputations, official visits stretched before him, and as misgivings are starting to appear about how long the prosperity is going to last. Some of the early buildings, some of the early, some, some building societies are already starting to fail. The late 1880s were the last dying days of Australia Felix and the gold rush immigrants' dreams of a prosperous society, free of the entrenched class differences and constrained opportunities of the Britain they'd left. And it was the midpoint of Deacon's life when a man realises that he stopped growing up and started to grow old. Opportunities remain for achievement and success, but the limitless horizons of a fortunate youth are gone, and with them youth's reckless energies. And for Deacon, this realisation coincides with the end of the boom. As signs of trouble began to appear that the boom might end badly, Deacon's response was to talk up the need for confidence. Supporting the further expansion of railways, he claimed that Victoria was not like other massive borrowers such as Argentina. Forget the ugly pessimists, he said, our growth is genuine and real. And over the next three years, Deakin approached the growing financial crisis as if it was primarily a crisis of confidence, criticising the then Premier for always talking the place down, for only ever pointing to the dark side. Such comments, he said, do terrible damage to the credit of the country when they are reported in the English papers. And he put his oratorical gifts to the cause of maintaining financial confidence. There's a short-lived weekly Bohemia, which gives a vivid description of Deacon addressing a meeting of panicked shareholders at the City of Melbourne Building Society, of which he was the chairman. Miraculously, Bohemia reports, his silver tongue converted them from a den of roaring lions to a nest of sucking doves. 
Now, in this non-oratorical age, it's hard to grasp the messianic power some orators had to quiet or to sway a crowd. As the crisis mounted, Deacon, in a way, chose not to put this extraordinary power to the general service of the colony. David Syme was urging him to become Premier, and over the next few years, others did so too. But almost any time, he could have returned to the leadership. Um, yet he chose to stand aside from 1890 onwards, as the confidence in the financial system continued to, st to seep away. He basically went to the back bench and then took up um, work at the bar to maintain his income. So the patterns of a life, I think, are revealed in the paths not taken as well as those chosen. It's this refusal, if you like, to take on responsibility at that crucial, in, in the crisis that the colony was facing that I think is very revealing for Deakin. Shortly after the nadir of the crash, the Korowa Conference was held, which rescued the federal cause from its current political impasse and invested it with a new popular energy. Deacon threw himself into this revived federal cause with feverish energy, finding in it a restored sense that he was an instrument of a higher purpose. To stay buoyant, Deacon needed to be carried along by something greater, to be part of a general sense of progress, movement, power. And federation was the answer, as he transferred his sense of destiny adeptly from the floundering colony to the emerging nation his teleological optimism from Victoria to Australia. Many other Victorians followed him, and although they lacked his providential sense of destiny, they shared in his shift of focus from the catastrophe they'd, that had befallen the colony to the possibilities of the emerging nation, and Victorian became uh, the most enthusiastic colony for Federation. To conclude, I want to say something about the title for the lecture, The Enigmatic Mr Deacon. The federal cause was successful, and in 1900, Deacon was a member of the Australian delegation to London for the passing of the Constitution Bill. Now, while he's there, he negotiated with the conservative newspaper, The Morning Post, to write an anonymous weekly letter on Australian affairs. He would be paid 500 pounds a year, which was not inconsiderable, some for him at the time, and would go some way to repairing his damaged finances. The arrangement was initially for a year, but it lasted until 1914. That is, it lasted through all of his three periods as Prime Minister. Now, the identity of the Australian correspondent was a source of much speculation, and Deakin took great pains to keep it hidden. It was written as if from Sydney, the name used for transmitting the letters via the Eastern Telegraph Company was Andrew Oliver, and the address to which the telegraphs were sent was Posterity London. Now, in these letters, Deacon wrote about events in which he was a key player. Here, um, he is descri in, in describing the manoeuvres in 1909 between the Victorian Liberal Party and the New South Wales Conservatives in the months leading up to the fusion of those two parties into one. For reasons known only to himself, which are a perpetual subject of controversy in our press, Mr Deacon pursues his enigmatic methods of action. He has been busily employed in this city, Sydney, when passing to and returning from Queensland in consultation with his friends and supporters. It has become known that here they are anxiously pressing him to come to terms with Mr Joseph Cook so that the three sections of the federal parliament opposed to the Labor caucus may be consolidated without further delay. To this prompt settlement on grounds which can only be guessed, even by his intimates, he remains determinedly opposed. In spite of Mr Deacon's persistent elusiveness, the pressure brought to bear upon him from within his own party as much as from without appears so strong that some unexpected development must be at hand. Now notice that not only is this anonymous, but that as Deacon is putting his own inscrutability at the centre of the action, describing his enigmatic methods of action, his persistent elusiveness, the way he keeps others guessing. Now, he's clearly enjoying himself, he's teasing his audience, but he's also making the question of his intentions the pivot of the action. For Deacon is still a 19th century individualist, and it is the decisions of individuals that make history. Perhaps when he wrote this, Deacon himself still did not quite know what he would do, though by the time the letter was being read in London six weeks later, he was already Prime Minister again. 
Deakin retired from po federal politics in January 1913. In his final years, his fine mind, as I said, was overcome by dementia. It happened slowly, and he was all too aware of the holes forming in his memory, observing the deterioration of his mind in the moments of lucidity he was granted. And he wrote this in 1915. I still live, along, uh, live among my books. That is true, but utterly misleading. It is true I read some of them, not many, with delight, but I rem remember none of them for more than a few hours. To live among scores of books once forgotten, nerves rent by utterly helpless struggles to recall or revive the simplest or most important events of my life. No banishment was ever more complete. A stranded mariner in a deep sense of solitary, kindness and consideration surround me, but I have lost even my tongue and fail with my pen to sketch with rough outline what I desire to convey. To the very end, Deacon was an observer himself, and to the very end, he was a puzzle to himself, an enigma. Later in 1915, he wrote what were to be almost his last words, and I'll end uh, with these. Not only has my memory founded as a whole, but I have now become a mere juggler with myself, misleading and misconstruing myself. The helpless attempts to read the riddle of my mind must be abandoned.